A very good morning to all of you. Welcome back to the channel and today's analysis session. So this is going to be for 29th of June 2023. So starting with the first article, which is talking about the surge in the food prices, we are again seeing the prices going up. So it shows that inflation is far from tamed. So as we were saying that even RBS Monte Policy Committee said that we're still, you know, maintaining vigil on how inflation, how that's faring, how that is performing. So it's important and specifically in the context of food inflation, we were like having speculations that it is possible that it might go up. So we are seeing that prices of rice, wheat, turdal, sugar, milk, potato, onion, tomato, they are climbing. And Consumer Affairs Ministry says that the seasonal factors, they are responsible for the spike. So government is monitoring the prices on daily basis. And what the government can do is that it can release the buffer stock into the market so that supply increases and the demand supply mismatch is the, the gap between them is reduced. So that's there. And here we having the prices one, one month, one year and five year prices accordingly for these commodities. So that's there. Apart from this, a biofertilizer scheme gets a central government's green light. So here, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, it approved the PM Pranam scheme. So it stands from Prime Minister Program for Restoration, Awareness, Generation, Nourishment and Amelioration of Mother Earth. So that is a promise. It was made in the last budget. And you can find out about more features about this biofertilizer scheme. So the scheme is basically aimed at saving the soil and promoting sustainable, balanced use of fertilizers. And it uh, involves the participation of state governments also. So here we are having, like we can say that this can be an example of cooperative federalism as well. So we are having an update. Uh, we see that UPSC aspirants they move high court over vague questions in prelim. So what uh, is the definition of vague? It is to be understood and that can create problems. Like uh, over, uh, like everybody has different interpretation of the word vague. So we see that they are moving to Delhi High Court and claiming that the recently conducted civil services prelims exam was full of vaguely worded questions that were open to subjective interpretation. So petition stated that many questions in the examination had more than two possible answers, but UPSC decides that one of them is the correct answer and marks the candidates accordingly. So this is what the petition says. Let's see what would be the high court's verdict over this. Again, we are seeing everyday article talking about the Uniform Civil Court. So this is just a repeat, we'll not take this up again. Apart from that, moving forward, finding what are the other important articles for today. So increasing stray dog attacks is a violation of child rights. So this is one dimension to it. So Kerala State Commission for the Protection of Child Rights have moved Supreme Court saying that these instances of uh, the stray dogs attacking on children often with fatal results and inaction on the part of the state authorities is violation of child rights. So the commission represented, uh, you can see, so here, So a petition was filed and it sought a direction from the Apex Court for euthanizing the suspected rabid dogs and extremely dangerous dogs. So here basically uh, this can also be part of like GS4 ethics as well. What are the ethical conflicts here? So you can think about them. Then... Coming to editorial page. So let's see what are the developments, important articles here. So manifestly arbitrary and clearly unconstitutional. So here, this is uh, in the context of the Delhi Legislative Assembly elections. 
in 2015, we saw that soon after the Amarni party, it won the Delhi Legislative Assembly elections by a significant margin. Central government issued a notification taking control over the services in the national capital territory. So this basically sparked an eight-year-long legal battle between the two. And it involved four rounds of litigation before the Supreme Court. So in May 2023, the court ruled decisively in favor of the Delhi government. So we have been like discussing in detail. We have analyzed all the developments previously. So here, basically, the Delhi Services Ordinance, it undermines the principle of representative democracy and responsible governance. So these are the keywords, and these are definitely the pillars of the Indian constitutional order. So you need to know about Article 239AA of the Constitution, which basically encodes Delhi's special status. And that is obviously expressly authorizes Parliament to pass laws with respect to fields that are normally within the exclusive competence, competence of the states. So Mahalanobis in the era of big data and AI. So it's an extremely important article. Please pay your attention while we start analyzing it. So Professor PC Mahalanobis, who introduced statistics to India, is a scientist whose absence is, uh, is felt dearly even today. So Mahalanobis' lifelong courtship with statistics, his unwavering and fearless leadership to advance a statistics and survey culture in India, the founding of the Indian Statistical Institute, and his nurturing of a generation of outstanding academicians have all left behind an enduring legacy. So when we talk about India in the Malanobis era, nearly five decades prior to his passing away in 1972, Today, in the midst of the shifting socio-economic dynamics in post-pandemic India, he is greatly missed. So what would have been his take when we talk about the growing big data and AI, their usage in today's time? So the age of big data. So over the past 20 years, there has been a global shift in both the nature of the data and as well as statistics. So with the advent of the internet and virtually everything that is confined to the internet of things, there has been a flood of data. Most of it is junk. So we now have much more data than what is available, than what available technology it can leverage. So this is widely perceived as the era of big data. So another significant yet related issue is how artificial intelligence that is transforming our lives and the lifestyles. So the state of society that is precarious. And one can wonder how Mahalanobis, who is a statistical doyen and a key figure in the early development of the Indian democracy, would have responded to big data related craziness and the AI driven revolution. Though speculative, the answer would be based on his legacy. So obviously we are analyzing things on the basis of his previous decisions and his legacy, what would have been his take right now? So historically data, it often appears to be big when the available technology at that time, it fails to analyze it. So that's why we term it as big data. So Mahalanobis, he also encountered a big data problem when his large scale surveys yielded lots of data that needed to be looked into for effective planning. So definitely he played an important role in India's planning. So you can find out about his role in like he, he was involved in which of the five-year plans and what was his contributions. Again, uh, like coming back to this article. So how did he respond to this when he faced similar kind of situation back then? So well to handle tons of data and tackle the complex mathematical calculations, he persuaded the government and succeeded in procuring the first two digital computers of the country. And that was at his Indian Statistical, Inst Statistical Institute in 1956 and 58. And thus he ushered in the age of computers in India. So that's how you can say that's how uh, computers made a beginning in India. So it was indeed a remarkable ac accomplishment by a statistician. So that was back then uh, kind of a new introduction into the Indian economy. And that's how he was able to resolve this issue of big data. So problems during COVID-19, so when we try to understand them, Marlon Obis, he was a physicist by training, a statistician by instinct, and an economist by conviction. 
So he had an uncanny knack for embracing technology for the human welfare, perhaps as a result of his background in physics. So he like he was a supporter of technology for human welfare. So it should be used in a way that it ensures human welfare. So that we can relate to the current usage or the current concerns that we have with artificial intelligence, whether it would be ethically used or not. So he even built some simple machines to facilitate his surveys and measurements as well. So thus one may safely perceive that he would have embraced the power of artificial intelligence in enhancing human productivity. So not just, you know, the power of artificial intelligence, but that needs to be in the context of enhancing human productivity. So again, a like limited usage and responsible usage of AI and as well as the regulated usage of AI. So he would have supported this particular stance. So in case of like big data analysis and perhaps in a way that is far more effective than how AI is currently applied to that goal. So he could possibly be able to lead the big data analysis considerably better than anybody else today, even in the absence of AI, as no one is likely to comprehend the survey dynamics or the heartbeat of data as he did back then. So one recent big data foil, uh, foil for instance, involved numerous contradictory projections during the COVID-19 era. So that was one hurdle in terms of analyzing the data and then different sorts of economic losses due to the pandemic that need to be properly evaluated for a balanced recovery so that accordingly government can announce the schemes and other policy measures. And one could argue that if Mahal Mahalanobis was alive today, the country's COVID-19 response could have been much stronger. So if he was in the lead, our data might be beyond question and the analysis might be far more accurate. So in India's plan man, so he's also known as the plan man, could be the best person for planning to build the optimal health-related infrastructures for combating the future disasters as well. But obviously that's not possible today. And talking about the AI regulation, so after like around seven decades ago when we talk about the situation, so from the perspective of the newly independent nation, planning with the aid of extensive technocratic exercises with democratic participation. So you need to focus upon these keywords. So that moved from the realm of politics primarily due to Mahalanobis. So now we are at the crossroads and India's upcoming census that will be a digital exercise. So dynamics of other services are also bound to change in the new normal setup. So that is how statistics is evolving and we would miss the leadership of an expert such as Malinobis from this changed statistical perspective. So now talking about AI, so definitely it is as AI, it is threatening to replace millions of jobs without creating alternatives and is also aiding in spreading disinformation, there is substantial global attempt to clip its wings. So never easy though, Malinovich, who is deeply inspired by Kautilya's Earth Shastra, successfully introduced the revolutionary concept of built-in cross-checks into a service. So as the world it struggles to regulate AI, could Malinovich, with his statistical instinct, also be instrumental in regulating it or not? So that may be possible, might be possible, it would have been a reality. So he envisioned statistics as a new technology for increasing the efficiency of human effort in the wildest sense. So even today, someone like Mahalanobis with an uncanny knack for perfection, tireless dedication, brilliant leadership. So again, these are the keywords. And who could understand the dance stems of numbers in the arena of time and space better than anybody else engaged in this business could be the best person to handle tons of data that we have today with its ever expanding nature and also embrace the benefits of the technologies for the human welfare and national development. So again, this is a very, very important article for us. And as I raised a few questions in between, so you can find out uh, their answers, some information, general information about them. So how much employment generation does the economy actually needs? 
So when we talk about the problem of jobless growth, that is one dimension. So you can like find out about that. And in the, even like in the context of India, it is often said that in, in India, we are witnessing a jobless growth like situation. So here, uh, in that context, it can we like we can relate to that question only. Ki, uh, how much employment generation is actually needed in the Indian economy? So the policymakers they talk of creating work for five million to eight million young in India that will barely scratch India's unemployment problem. So how many need work? The data it is based on the report the People's Commission on Employment and Unemployment was set up by Desh Bachao Abhyan and that was launched in 2022. So here we are having the data. So table one is talking about the historical birth rate, death rate, potential labor force of India between 2000 and 2022. So when we try to understand the trend of the birth rate, you can see it has increased. Oh, okay, from here we go. So it is falling. It was 26.6 in 2000 and it, now it is at 17.2. So uh, with this, what we are seeing, population has increased. So it means that death rate has reduced. So here um, we are having data for under five deaths and absolute deaths. So you can see that absolute deaths, even that has fallen and even under five deaths, that is also reduced. So that is the main reason why population has increased. And here in column six and column seven, youth population increase. So when we specifically talk about the youth population, so that is basically it has not uh, increased. It has rather reduced. And seventh column is talking about youth youth potentially entering the labor force so we don't have the data for 2022 here you can see the numbers spiking up massively so this is one thing which is indicating towards that how many jobs are needed in the economy So here, when we go by this article, even when we talk about the unorganized sector, so it is like mechanized and automated and generates few jobs. So that is why around 94% of the labor force is in the unorganized sector, largely working at the low wages. And when we uh, like go by the data, the eShram portal, 28 crore, they were registered in November 2022 and 94% reported earning less than rupees 10,000 per month. So the growth of the organized sector at the expense of the unorganized sector results in rising unemployment. So this is one challenge and unemployment, it has been characterized as unemployment, underemployment, disguised unemployment. So these are different forms of unemployment apart from these like there exist structural unemployment, frictional unemployment. So you need to like know about the basic differences amongst all them and those who have like stopped looking for the work as well. So uh, simplified assumptions, uh, they give the figure of those needing proper work at 286 million, all of them from the unorganized sector. So these are the figures for only unorganized sector and only 332 million, they have proper work and most of them also work in the unorganized sector only. So the data, it makes it clear for the policymakers to like creating work for around five to eight million youth that will barely scratch India's unemployment problem. So critical minerals, first you need to clear with their basic definition, critical minerals listed by Indian government and push for the clean energy. So 30 minerals, nickel, titanium, vanadium, tungsten, they have been identified as minerals critical for India's ambition for cleaner technologies in electronics and telecommunications. Then World Bank is going to fund power sector reforms in Himachal Pradesh. Apart from this, the decadal best fall of the non-performing assets in March. So we are seeing that the number is declining. That is definitely one of the positive signs for the Indian economy, the strength of the India's banking and the financial sector. So 
they have uh, like fallen by 3.9 percentage so the gross uh, non performing assets of the scheduled commercial banks are expected to improve further to 3.4 percent changing economy the rural west bengal so now it is specific to only one state so that is why it will not be so so very important for us but we'll just go through the gist of this article so the first characteristic of the rural west bengal that stands out is a gradual secular process of households losing land of depeasantization and subsequent proletarianization so with a decline in the scale of the employment in both agriculture sector also in manufacturing the sectors that have generated employment are the construction and services sector so that is a positive indication uh, when we talk about the structural change and uh, now a rich class particularly engaged in the real estate and the several other local businesses it was prompted uh, to the role of high profile party organizers and it became the core managerial elements in the Trinamool party. So we'll just skip this article. So Savarkar, he did not consider Hindutva as equivalent of Hinduism. So it was not just, you know, um, as we interpret today in a uh, narrow form, but that was not uh, what he advocated for. Like his Hindutva was not only restricted to Hinduism promotion. So the resurrection of Savarkar may be complete, but in the recent uh, birthday celebrations that coincided with the inauguration of the new parliament building, his followers forget the century office foundational text that is Essentials of Hindutva. So firstly, we'll understand how did he became a hero. So this is not the first time that he has been at the center of a geographical celebration. So in 1924, a reporter for the Times of India observed that India was experiencing an orgy of hero worship. So this was a period in which revolutionaries, they were publicly fettered for their bravery and valor. And reporter noted that was Savarkar who received the greatest public attention during that time period. And for the second half of the 20th century, Savakar largely remained on the margins of public culture in India following M.K. Gandhi's murder trial in which he was tried as a co-conspirator and eventually he was released. So there is no doubt that he has been resurrected over the past decade with the patronage of the BJP and the Sangh Parivar. He's a ghost father no more. And it uh, would be fair to say that his name has risen like the phoenix in recent years. But it is the bulbul that he's associated with for now, thanks to his supporters who imagine the songbird as his ride in the magical travels across the seas. So in his writings, he often compared himself to Ramchandru, whom he classified as the greatest hero in Hindu history. So it is no surprise that a recent proclamation by politicians in Maharashtra declared him as a god and his life story is technically off the limits to criticism as per section 295a of the indian constitution that punishes individuals accused of hurting the religious feelings of any class of citizens of india so basically it is the sedition provision and anyone who speaks or writes about savarkar now risks accusations of blasphemy by those afflicted with hindu fragility so what we are doing today is the limited analysis. So yet Indians across the political spectrum, they can't stop talking and writing about him. And gone are the days when one could read a newspaper or watch the news without having to think about Savarkar. So basically today is like basically related more to the political things today. So it is important to understand his definition of Hindutva. So in Essentials of Hindutva, he writes that Hindutva is not a word, but a history. And the tagline reads, Hindutva dharm nahi, itihas hai. It is, it is not a religion, it is history. So this film 
could not have been made in today's India without the approval of Sangh Parivar and the government censored board of film certification. So the filmmaker has had to ensure that Savarkar's life story is depicted in a geographical spirit that celebrates the making of Veer Savarkar, yet modifying his only definition of Hindu through for marketing purposes will likely not meet any charges of blasphemy or hurt the sentiments from Hindutva Hindu Vadis who probably they've not spent any time pondering the meaning of Savarkar's key sentence. So, in fact, he condemns the term Hinduism as a Western construct in his book, arguing that it is a dogma incorrectly used by Orientalist scholars. So, he adds that Hinduism should also be abandoned given its imprecise and unsatisfactory uses. So by contrast, Hindu dharm is Savarkar's favorite compound to discuss the religion and culture of Hindus. So he says, dharma was not merely a religion, but it is constituted all the thoughts and actions of Hindus. So in fact, Hindu dharm is closer, closer to his interpretation of Hindutva than any other conceptualization. So tribal safety concerns leads to many zero FIRs in Manipur and cookies, they allege the police, the police bias now because uh, now it is like they are seeing that they are like ensuring tribal safety. They are supporting them. Not uh, I would not use the word supporting them, but yeah, ensuring their safety concerns. So that's why they are filing zero FIR. So now cookies, uh, they also basically, they allege that police bias is... It exists. So Kuki is a tribal community which is found in the state of Manipur. So almost a third of the 5,960 cases of arson and violence registered in Manipur over the past 56 days, they were filed by police irrespective of the jurisdiction. Um, and on average, more than 100 cases, they were filed every day. So this is uh, like you can understand this as a form of a case study, which can uh, help you in GS4 ethics. So out of the total such cases, 1700 cases or nearly 30% first information reports, there were zero FIRs filed so motu by the police irrespective of their jurisdiction. So this is one problem area. And of these, around 2,200 FIRs they have been filed since June 3 after the visit of the Home Minister. And so FIRs, they're not restricted to arson and violence, but also includes decoity, murder, looting of weapons, and other criminal cases. So the Manipur Tribal Forum, Delhi, in a petition filed in the Supreme Court, said that the Manipur police had filed standard FIRs mostly against the tribal community that is Kukis, most of them on behalf of the Meiti community. So Meiti is the majority community uh, in Manipur. So it is believed by the tribals that the police is basically supporting the majority community that is Meitis. So our external affairs minister says that prime minister's visit to U.S. was the most productive ever. So India-U.S. relationship is doing exceptionally well. And he, uh, like Modi, he says, is seen by the international community as an authentic Indian who actually speaks for India. So I think we were in a state when we were trying uh, really to address the obstacles of the relationship. And today we have moved into the positive domain. So we've discussed a lot about India-US relationship and the new developments, how basically we can say a new era is beginning between the two countries. So no doubt it's a very important topic and you need to have all the things at one place.
So India and the United States are willing to deploy ships in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, according to the U.S. ambassador. And speaking the Indian Institute of Technology, he said that in interest of safeguarding peace, prosperity, and sovereign borders, India and U.S. they could join hands to resist the might makes right mentality in international affairs. So these are the keywords and. I hope soon uh, we'll see the United States and India working together across the Pacific and into the Atlantic from Central Asia to Southern Africa. And we can stand together against those who would append the common good for their own benefit. So this is basically pointing towards China and we can deploy our ships together in the Pacific and Indian Oceans and even beyond to ensure maritime security. The so center is also planning a market scheme to promote sustainable living. So let's try to understand it more. So it aims at incentivizing a host of activities like afforestation, water conservation, water and waste management by generating green credits. So the Ministry of uh, Environment it has issued a draft notification detailing a proposed green credit scheme that will incentivize a host of activities that we have seen. It would be working and focusing upon these areas by allowing the individuals and organizations to generate green credits. So uh, whenever like you're participating in such kind of activities and you're adhering to the this particular scheme and its provisions so you will be granted with green credits and these credits though uh, yet to be specified mechanism they can also be traded for money so that would be basically the main attraction of it and it is believed that it would attract people more towards it because then uh, basically you can trade these green credits for money so a green credit program is proposed to be launched at national level to leverage a comparative market-based approach for green credits, thereby incentivizing voluntary environmental actions of various stakeholders. So it was all it will like also encourage the private sector industries and companies as well as other entities to meet their existing obligations stemming from other legal frameworks by taking actions which are able to converge with the activities relevant for generating or buying the green credits. So basically, not just you know the civil society or the people per se, but even uh, it can like also you know attract the private sector. So let's see what uh, would be the four like further details about it once we uh, have them public. So NOTO warns against the online promotion of organ trade. So the National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization, it has issued a warning against the private websites and social media posts promoting and offering organs for trade. So it is like seeking strict monitoring of and steps to prevent organ trafficking. And uh, apart from this, the organization, it said that the online promotion, it was in violation of provisions of the Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissue Act 1994. And basically it can attract fines up to rupees 2 lakhs, uh, 2 lakhs between two, two, sorry, 20 lakhs and 1 crores and imprisonment from 5 years to 10 years. So this organization, NOTO, it is mandated to, mandated to establish a network for the organ pro procurement and distribution and to maintain a national registry on organ donation and transplantation. So uh, the Union Cabinet, it finally clears the National Research Foundation Bill 2023. And that uh, would be basically offering further strategic direction to research in India. And another thing that we often say about the research and development sector in India is the uh, like very minimal amount of allocation in terms of GDP for this sector. So legislation aims to established the NRF as an apex body to provide high level strategic direction to scientific research in the country under the national education policy at an estimated cost of rupees 50,000 crores. And 
the Department of Science and Tech will be the administrative department of the NRF, which will have a governing board of eminent researchers and professionals. So prime minister will be the ex-official president of the board and union ministers of science and tech and education, the ex-official vice presidents. So the functioning of this body, it will be governed by an executive council chaired by the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. So the new law, it will repeal the science and engineering research board, which was established by parliament in 2008 and it subsumes it into the NRF. So this body it is meant to ensure that scientific research was conducted and funded equitably with greater participation from the private sector. And right now we have eminent institutions like we have IITs and IISCs and get a bulk of research funding, but the state universities, they get very little amount. But 10% of the research, uh, like about 10% of the research funds goes to the public or the state universities. So we need to correct this thing. So government will be contributing around rupees 10,000 crores over a period of five years. And the main source of funds for the department, the Department of Science and Technology, this says that the main source of funds for the several autonomous research bodies will continue to get the uh, budget it annually receives. Coming to the world page. So Myanmar Janta airstrikes, it kills, tells civilians and damages 11 houses. So yesterday we uh, like took up this topic in the context of the refugee influx into the India. That is an important topic. And apart from this, Sweden grants permit for Quran burning protest outside mosque. So new, uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister scores trade deals on China trip. So Putin moves in to assert the state authority and issues a clear message that Wagner is no longer a favorite. So Wagner forces uh, get three choices. Sign up with the defense ministry is the one choice they have. Second is return home or move to Belarus. Third, the political analysts say that the whole crisis, they exposed cracks in the statehood. So these three options were there. And... Ordinary Russians, they have uh, the heave a sigh of relief as the bloodshed it was averted as Wagner Group decided to go back to Belarus. On the business page, so here we are having RBS governor, he says that Indian economy is resilient despite the global risks. So this is one of the most important topics and it is definitely showing the strength and the resilience of Indian economy despite the global headwinds. So India's financial system has been stable and resilient despite significant strains in the West and non-performing assets of the Indian banks it, it fell to 10-year low of 3.9% in the month of March. So these are some positive developments and often this thing is uh, obviously it is getting repeated a number of times when we talk about the resilience or how Indian economy is performing given the global challenges that exist. So the stress test, it indicates that Indian banks will be able to withstand even severe stress scenarios and balance sheets of both the banks and the corporates. They have strengthened to give India an advantage and the net non-performing assets of the Indian banks dropped to 1%. So India finally defers the 20% tax plan on the foreign spend. So in May, the center said that it would tax the overseas spending via the global debit of the credit cards. So now we have delayed this thing and right now like it has been delayed so that is kind of a relief for the consumers or the spenders
So sugar mills, they expand the ethanol capacity and or they're adding new facilities for the ethanol production. So the install capacity of the sugar mills for the ethanol production is currently 730 crore liters a year. And it is learned that almost 85% of the ethanol supply comes from sugar mills. So Niti Aayog, it estimates that more than 1000 crore liters of ethanol is required for 20% blending of petrol. So this would be also, you know, even helping the farmers as well in increasing their income. Coming to the main newspapers, so decoding the European Union's aggressive trade measures. So let's understand all of these. So driven by the domestic and the geopolitical factors, European Union, it has armed up a legislative push aimed at reaching its ambitious climate goals. But uh, these pieces of legislation, they could have consequences for global trade. So what are the laws and what is driving them? So among the laws are the carbon tax that we often talk about. That's a regulation on deforestation and a directive on due diligence for corporate sustainability. So climate goals are the big factor which are fueling these legislations. So representing a technologically and economically advanced bloc European Union, uh, they're like the lawmakers, they're addressing the climate change with great urgency. And these laws are in line with the European Union's ambition to be climate neutral by 2050. So India's target is 2070. But this could raise trade tensions also with developing countries and poor countries, they argue, to the rich world by pushing these stringent trade legislations, they're shifting the burden of climate change mitigation on the developing countries. So that's one issue. So are there any other motives behind these moves or not? So yes, there are, and it faces a key roadblock in implementing the strict climate policies. So their industries, they're moving their manufacturing bases to the developing nations that have lax emission norms. So this is one thing that the European Union will have to deal with, and it is called the... Um, carbon leakage because the companies are shifting their manufacturing bases to the countries where the taxes or where the legislations they're not so strict so this is called carbon leakage so the european union carbon tax it targets the industries like cement iron and steel aluminium fertilizers which they are more prone to moving away from european union so blog it now plans to widen the scope of the carbon tax going forward and it has introduced the legislation in this regard So what are the concerns that have been raised by India? So the sheer number of laws for one is the first concern. Then they complicate the trade also. So India is also concerned about the cost of compliance for the small and medium businesses. And most Indian exporters to European Union they are small businesses. So which is why India has sought exemptions for them from the carbon tax. And we aim to take on the laws of the WTO as well on the grounds that they breach international environmental laws. So this is India's stand. So is there nothing good for the Indian businesses under this scenario? So here we are having the views of a professor uh, at ICR IER which is a think tank and believes that European Union legislation can benefit India also as regulatory requirements. They have in fact been made easier. So she says that prior to these laws, European Union states, they had separate laws that meant multiple entry certificates. But now there will be one law which would be applicable across Eurozone. So this would make things easier for the Indian exporters and a uniform law. Indian exporters, they would find it simpler to enter and operate in the markets. Then talking about the European Union's Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive that is also in line with India's UN commitments that discourage child labor and human rights violations. So even this thing is favorable. So what should actually India do about these laws? How we need to react or do we, you know, need to take some new measures in order to comply with them or not? So here, a former civil servant and European Union expert suggested a coalition 
of developing nations to defend their interest as you as the European Union legislation, it will impact developing nations the most. So this is one suggestion going forward coming from her. And such pressure worked in the past, but in um, like after intense international pressure, European Union had to block a law that proposed making all the airlines using EU airports to buy the carbon allowances. So like such types of legislations we saw, they were blocked in the past. So she's basically saying that all the developing countries, they need to form a block and need to raise their concerns collectively, saying that such types of legislations, they would be hampering the interest of developing countries the most. So she said that India should create a legal framework to enable the businesses pay taxes on the carbon emissions within India rather than to European Union. So if this thing would be you know, specifically working in the context of within the Indian economy, so that would also help the government also in reducing the fiscal burden and the fiscal deficit also and helping in raising more amount of tax revenues. So that is another thing. Like instead of, you know, paying to the European Union, you can pay to the Indian government itself so that the money remains within the economy and then it can be further used for other developmental measures. And that would also help us. And as I said, the fiscal prudence. So that is one of the suggestions. Going by the quote of the day, so we have a future of boundless opportunities and we can stand together against coercion. We can stand together for peace. We are going to unlock the true potential of India-US relationships. So this is coming from the US ambassador to India. So India attends the International Ukraine Donor Conference quietly. So India has remained neutral over the Ukraine war. Firstly, you need to be clear with what has been India's stance over this war. And conference condemned Russia for the war for the attack. So government officials and business executives from India, they attended an international meeting, which is known as the Ukraine Recovery Conference, which was held in London. And that was to secure funds for the reconstruction of Ukraine and persons aware of the matter. They said this thing. So the move assumed significance given that India it has remained neutral over the Ukraine war since. And the conference strongly condemned Russia for the invasion. So India, it we have given uh, Ukraine the aid. It is unclear whether attending the conference reflects a shift in India's stance on the war or not. And India also tends to avoid multilateral platforms to disperse the fund preferably, like preferring to do so bilaterally. So we prefer to give it the funds directly to Ukraine instead of, you know, giving it indirectly through multilateral platforms. So even like if India attend, if we have attended this conference also, so our stand is like, obviously we maintain the status quo because right now we are not seeing any, you know, public functionary coming and speaking about India's changed stance, if it has changed or not. So we'll be going by the status quo. This we have already seen panel finds 30 minerals critical to India. So that would be playing an important and critical role in meeting our ambitions so we have seen this includes lithium and vanadium so lithium it will be used in the batteries and obviously they play an important role when we talk about expanding the electric vehicles in india and these are those minerals which are at the risk of supply shortage and which may have a larger impact on the economy compared to other raw materials so here we have some supply chain concerns related to them. So we are taking steps in order to reduce our import dependence upon them. And we are looking to lower the dependence on imports as much uh, of these minerals, which come specifically from China. So that is a concern. And in the context of semiconductor chips also, we are doing the same thing.
coming to financial express newspapers so here this we have seen that the overseas card spends are out of tax net for now then sebi defers the decision on ter for the mutual fund so ipo listing time that has been halved and fpi disclosures they have been more widened so market moves for free three mutual fund schemes they have passive breach of 10 percent stock limit post hdfc hdfc bank merger and they will have three months to rectify this so the markets regulator received feedback from the mutual fund industry and more granular data that demonstrated that economies of scale has in fact been achieved to quite an extent so this is coming from the savvy chairperson So we used to often talk about the twin balance sheet problem, but today we had a look at this article. So when we talk about the twin balance sheet, so we're talking about the balance sheet of the corporates and the banks. So now that has turned into an advantage for India's growth. So here uh, we have the data as well for the gross non-performing assets ratio, how it has been declining. You can see for the public sector banks, it is sharply falling. Then for the private banks, FPs and all the scheduled commercial banks. So they right now stand at 3.9% out of March 2023. And then this second data is for the scheduled commercial banks, net non-performing assets ratio. So even that is sharply falling. So that is definitely very, very important for the India's financial sector. Green hydrogen mission, this is again an often repeated topic in the newspaper. So I have repeated this a lot of number of times or different types of hydrogen apart from the green hydrogen, like gray hydrogen, brown hydrogen, and what are different techniques which are used to manufacture them. And then obviously the provisions of the green hydrogen mission. And then what are the other initiatives that the Indian government is taking in order to ensure the green energy transition? And obviously then what are the targets that we have? So European Union, it agrees to India plea for structured talks on the carbon tax. So since we had a look at what the concerns of India regarding it. So we are engaging in talks with the European Union for this. And India claims that small and medium companies, they need a helping hand. So they need to be like given an exemption. And in 2022, India's 27% of the exports of iron, steel and aluminium products, they went to European Union. So when we talk about MSP, so for similarly for sugarcane, we have the FRP and then uh, a different price is also announced by the state governments also. So government, it has hiked the sugarcane FRP by rupees 10 per quintal. So there is again a marginal increase. Uh, I don't think so. This would be really helpful to the farmers. So here we are having the data, the trend about the changing uh, sugarcane FRP. So in the, uh, the industry, it seeks hike in the minimum selling price as well. So government has announced it by an uh, increase of rupees 10 per quintal. So now it goes up to 315 per quintal for the current season. So the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs, it has approved the increase subject to the base sugar recovery of 10.25%. So these critical minerals that are important for India's development from the perspective of the national security as well. And we have finally identified 30 of them. And the first list is also, it has also been prepared. So these are all the 30 critical minerals.
So even in the context of Baidu's, we are seeing new developments every day. So US fund reviews its $250 million Baidu's loan. And half of the funds have already been dispersed so far. So the forum is reviewing its lending decision after the company lost its auditor and three board members in the same week. So US firm's decision to hold back the funds poses a fresh headache for the company that is trying to boost investor confidence. So reskilling the staff is the top priority at Infosys. So as the employees, they become more skilled, multiple career paths into exciting technology spaces open for them within the Infosys ecosystem. So that's important. Coming to the Indian Express newspaper, so this we've already talked about, the National Research Foundation. Then this is also discussed, decision about the credit card has been put on hold as of now. Talking about Chandrayaan 3, so it would take off on July 13. So as over 12,000 people, they cross over from Manipur, Mizoram says it need some help. So again, this is an important topic from uh, the perspective of internal migration. So having accommodated more than 12,000 people from violence hit Manipur so far, the neighboring state of Mizoram, it is beginning to feel the strain with the top officials reiterating the need for funds from the center. So if you are DM, so what steps would you take in order to ensure the safeguarding the rights and the interest of the people migrating from Manipur? So again, this can be one of the case studies. So after 12 years, we see United Nations drops India from its report on children and conflict. So it has taken India off a list of the countries mentioned in report on children and armed conflict over the alleged recruitment and the use of boys by the armed groups in Jammu and Kashmir and their detention, killing and maiming by the security forces. So this is the first time since 2010 we are seeing this thing. So apart from India, countries like Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Lake Shad, based in Nigeria, Pakistan, and the Philippines, uh, they are on this list. So India has been removed from the list in the view of the measures that have been taken by the government to better protect children. So we are seeing gross NPAs falling and the standard 3.9% this March. So G20 meet on infrastructure, it ends, and you can see in this picture, Uttarakhand Chief Minister, with the foreign delegates who participate in the G20 Infrastructure Working Group meeting at Rishikesh, and the people who participate in the rituals. So three-day meeting, it comes to an end. So CGI calls for technology use for better justice delivery. 
So how can, you know, technology, it can help us again in increasing the efficiency of work and ensuring more, like, dispersal of welfare to the people, to the far-flung areas. So he says that, I know it is impossible for many million people to approach the courts or even think of approaching them because it is not possible for a common man to keep visiting the courts. So when we talk about the merger of HDFC and HDFC Bank, so how the consumers and the financial sector will be impacted by this? So why did the uh, uh, HDFC top brass, uh, basically what do they feel about this decision? What do they think would be the impacts? So it, like, it will have separate board meetings, but uh, the officers to seal the finally, so it will be the last board meeting Okay, every employee under the age of 60 will be absorbed and salaries will not be reduced. HDFC Bank, it will need our people because they don't have the knowledge of the mortgages. And then, so both of them, they are working towards completing all the necessary formalities for the completion of the proposed amalgamation as per the tentative date. And both the organizations, uh, they do not have similar products. So the bank has everything other than housing and HDFC Limited does own the housing. So the commonality of the roles is limited and it is limited to certain corporate functions. So why was this merger actually announced? So there were three key factors that made it an opportune time to go ahead with the merger. So even like if the then prevailing low interest rate environment was supported and a decline in the RBA CRR and SLR requirements from 27% to, to, uh, to 22% and high liquidity in the system also made sense to go ahead with the current decision. So you need to know about the meaning of the CRR and the SLR, statutory liquidation, the cash reserve ratio. So source said that uh, one more additional factor that pushed everyone for this merger was the success, uh, the succession issue at the HDFC Limited. The key leadership person at the HDFC, they were nearing the age of 70 now, and they thought that the merger with H HDFC Bank will bring out the best of the synergy benefits for both the entities. So it is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences that leads to dividing us. So campaign code, again, about the Uniform Civil Code reaches the deep inside personal spaces. It calls for negotiation, which is a bitter poll campaign, which creates the space. So we've already taken up this topic, not going into the details. So China's challenge to the existing world order leaves US and India with no choice but to strengthen their relationship. Again, we have talked about this and we have talked about what is the US ambassador to India I had to say over this again, the same topic. So not only should we expect the US to adopt a transactional approach and strike deals that buttress its interests, but we must reciprocate by seeking to advance our own national interest at every step. So whether it is the HAL General Electric deal for the F414 turbojet co-production or the supply of the armed MQ-9B drones or the cooperation in semiconductor manufacturing or the joint space exploration, Indian experts, they must closely scrutinize the fine print of every contract and agreement and modify it if that is required. So here also things are getting repeated. So it is time to realize the potential of India-Philippines relations. So that is partnership of the future. So to harness the power of 
Indo Pacific as a catalyst for growth, more intensified regional cooperation is essential, and stronger economic integration, improved connectivity, increased innovation, they are key to buttressing the region as a global economic powerhouse. So as champions of the rule of law and inclusive multilateralism, the Philippines and India play important roles in this respect.